So be sure to keep her before the throne of grace. And um, remember the doctors and the everybody who has anything to do with it, that the Lord would give wisdom. Those of you here who are here Thursday heard Bonnie say that Northside High School has opened for Gary Horton, and we're really rejoicing in that. That's tremendous. She said that the principal is an unashamed Christian, and she's been trying to get in Northside for years with Gary, so we do rejoice in that. Oh, yeah, uh, she. Uh, there are she'll keep us posted, but. You'll notice that uh, Gary's uh, birthday comes up the 23rd of September. If you if you picked up the calendar today, we got the copy machine going. I don't know. Wayne tickled it or kicked it or something. I don't know what you do to get because the, the, the repairman hasn't come yet. But as soon as he does, it'll be back in shape. But anyway. Gary's birthday is the 23rd. He's, the, he's 51. Just a young snipper whapper compared to some. <clears throat> Open the word of truth to Acts chapter 11. Every believer is a priest, and every believer priest has the privilege of personally and privately preparing himself for the study of the word of God, using rebound if necessary, bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Now, thank you, precious Lord, for the privilege of studying together the Word. May God the Holy Spirit glorify God the Son and cause believers to advance spiritually to the place where they may become self-sustaining in the middle of the hostile environment of the devil's world. The Lord Jesus Christ may receive maximum glory in the lives of each one. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have finally progressed in Galatians chapter 1. To, uh, through the Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Verse 2, and all the brothers with me to the churches in Galatia. And in Acts chapter 11, we begin to study something about the churches in Galatia, those to whom the Apostle Paul writes. This uh, map details and uh, may be confusing because it's not in color. It'd be nice to have a nice colored map. Uh, uh, they're all so small of this area, however, but you'll notice you will recognize the land of Palestine over here. And uh, we recognize that in Palestine, the capital city of Jerusalem, was where the church began. And everything has been taking place at that point up until Acts chapter 11, or well, actually Acts, to, to, uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 and 2 is where, uh, because uh, we're, we actually skip in the consecutive narrative from Acts 8 uh, uh, 3 all the way to Acts eleven nineteen. Everything in there between is explanatory of something else. So uh, we're just looking at chapter 8 and there's no, no break between the uh, chapters. So Acts, Acts 7 concludes with the stoning of Stephen and uh, the uh, leadership of a young uh, zealot by the name of Saul uh, in chapter 8, verse 1, and then verse 1 continues of chapter 8 
on that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria now uh, then we have the, the, the burial of Stephen uh, verse 4 tells us those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went and then it picks up one of the men whose name was Philip and uh, details that now in Acts 11 19 those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen. You see, he picks it up right at that point to continue what was said in Acts chapter 8. Traveled, you'll notice, as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Now you'll notice from the map uh, where these uh, are. Uh, Phoenicia is the area which is located in northern Palestine, particularly here along the coast. Um, as we, uh, as you look at the island of Cyprus, and uh, you'll notice then the city of Antioch, which is located in this area. So you're seeing that they went beyond uh, the Jerusalem, uh, they went beyond Judea finally, they went even beyond Samaria. They actually went, started going now to the uttermost part of the world. This is how God uses even the wrath of men shall praise Him. See, God had told them to go into the world, but they hadn't. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, there they were told to go. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, they didn't go. They were still where, he, where, they, where they were started out at. And so the persecution comes, and when the persecution comes, God allows the persecution to accomplish His will, purpose, plan, and design for the church. Now, it says that uh, in verse 20 of Acts 11, some of, the, of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene. Cyrene was in North Africa, actually. So we have some men who, who come from Cyprus, Cyprus and others who come from North Africa, missionaries in the other direction, interestingly, uh, they come to Antioch, Antioch of Syria. Uh, the church, uh, and a church begins to be formed here. Uh, the Antioch, uh, to, and began to speak to Greeks also. Now this was a real breakthrough. Remember we saw the last words of verse 19, only to Jews. Now some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now at the same time, there was a, a famine which was being dealt to the entire uh, area of Palestine and uh, they were suffering greatly down here from a lack of food and uh, we will note that uh, uh, it becomes uh, difficult for them to uh, get along and we'll see later on how that uh, the uh, this church here the young church at Antioch uh, becomes a burden for the uh, church down at Jerusalem and actually sends some uh, relief to them. But uh, because of this persecution, uh, we recognize that uh, a church begins at Antioch. Now, Antioch of Syria was the third largest city in the Roman Empire, behind only two others. Rome was, of course, the largest. Alexandria, down here in Egypt, was the second, and the third largest city was located here in Syria. Uh, located beautifully on the Orontes River, a few miles from the coast, and very, very carefully planned, it was the commercial center, and since it was a commercial center, it was also the home of a large Jewish colony which had settled there located about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. 
it uh, it uh, it was a vile city, filled with gross immorality, ritual prostitution as part of its temple worship. And it was so uh, degraded as far as its morals is concerned that the uh, the proverb was that the the garbage from Antioch flowed all the way from the Orontes to Rome. Rome was also located on a river, not not the same river, obviously. Okay. And it's an interesting thing that in the middle of that kind of an environment that the, the church springs up. Uh, 1,300 miles from Rome, it has an impact on Rome even as far as its immorality is concerned. The interesting thing is something about that the unnamed believers from Cyrene and from Cyprus who had originally uh, uh, fled apparently from Jerusalem for because of the persecution uh, now return this time to Antioch and in so traveling it is their uh, uh, heart burden to teach the truth and when it says in verse 21 the Lord's hand was with them and many believing turned to the Lord many uh, trusted in Christ you wonder why their names weren't even recorded in in any place in the Bible uh, unsung heroes of the early church remind us of the principle that Paul has brought to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, where he says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. It has been said by someone, it's amazing how much can be accomplished when you don't care who gets the credit. And it is true. Here were people who were very, very concerned. And we have no idea who these evangelists were, but God knows. And God's record book in heaven is very accurate. Nothing that is ever done in the name of the Lord is ever forgotten by God. Now, obviously, if something's happening up here in Antioch, word is going to get back to the quote-unquote mother church in Jerusalem. And so it is that that's what happens in verse 22, Acts 11:22. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. And what they do is they ch turn to Mr. Grace. Now, uh, Barnabas was not his original name if you want to turn back just a bit uh, to uh, uh, earlier portion of the book of Acts uh, in the uh, uh, fifth chapter well at the end of the fourth chapter and the beginning of the fifth chapter we have we have the introduction of the man by the name of Barnabas. Uh, this is a t at a period of time, remember some of the things that took place in the early church, like we've already noted, are not things which continued on, but uh, the, all the believers, uh, if anybody had any possessions, he shared everything that he had. And uh, we read in uh, verse 36 that Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles nicknamed, we would say, Barnabas, meaning the son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This, of course, was the motivation for Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 5 to go on and seek to duplicate the approbation that was given. But so we realize his name means son of encouragement. And that's exactly what Barnabas was. 
I like to call him Mr. Grace because he really was one of the most gracious men in the early church and not a great deal is said about him but you have to see in the next few uh, incidents that he was totally oriented to the grace of God. But uh, anyway, uh, as he comes into this area uh, to Antioch, he arrives in verse 23 and he sees the evidence of the grace of God. And he was glad and uh, what does he do? He does what his name implies. He encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He is described as a good man, uh, full of the Holy Spirit and of doctrine. And we know that a great number of people were brought to the Lord. But one of the things about Barnabas has to be the fact that he knew his limitations. There aren't a whole lot of men who have that ability in humility to know their limitations. Most of us think we can do anything and everything. And a lot of pastors are particularly guilty of that. There were about 130 pastors at this meeting this morning. You could tell what they come to. They don't go to any meetings for theology or anything. And if they give out free books, pastors will be there en masse. Uh, you can count on it. But and I was looking at the line and I uh, commented to Bill. I said, uh, you know, it's interesting. Pastors come in all shapes and all sizes. What a conglomerate. I mean, uh, some were the typical pastor-looking pastors. And then you have these young snipper-whappers, and they don't want to look like pastors. So they, they look just the opposite of pastors. Anyway, who cares? What's, what does a pastor look like? I don't know. I had a, a friend who was a pastor in, a, in his town. He's from the old school. If he was working on his house and he ran out of nails before he would drive to town and buy nails he would take off his work clothes put on a suit and tie drive to town buy the nails drive back take it off put his work clothes on and go back to work because of the impression you have to make upon people but that's the way they are pastors sometimes think that they can do everything the old proverb used to say jack of all trades master of none uh, many times that's the case Furthermore, even if pastors can do a lot of things, they ought not to, as we have already studied in our previous uh, study of the a brief look at the pastor teacher, that though he can do many things, he must limit himself to the study of the Word of God and allow the members of the body of Christ to take care of the other things. All right, but at, at, when we notice this, that when he comes to a place where he realizes the job is bigger than he is. Verse 25, Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. In other words, apparently he had no illusions about himself. He was free from inordinate ambition, free from inordinate competition, willing to promote uh, a, f a fellow member of the body of Christ willing to recognize that someone else had a spiritual gift which was better uh, or more uh, uh, trained, more prepared than he. He went to Tarsus where he undoubtedly had heard that Saul uh, was laboring faithfully in the Word of God. And please note again that Saul or Paul when he comes into this ministry does not get pushy and simply serve the Lord in the place that God had put him. Now remember, how long is this? You remember the chronology from the uh, our original uh, study of, uh, of, uh, Paul, of Galatians 1.1? 1, 1? This is ten years. Paul has been laboring at Tarsus for ten years. That we could call it the ten lost years. Or maybe the ten years of silent preparation. Uh, in Moses' case, when uh, it was time for old Moses to, uh, in his eyes, to uh, uh, forsake Egypt, he became the great judge, and he went out and solved the dispute between an Egyptian and an Israelite 
by slaying the Egyptian. Now is my time. Uh, here I am, you know, I have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. The next day, he saw two Israelites arguing, and he went to the Israelites and started to solve the dispute. And somebody, one of them turned and said, Were well, you going to kill one of us like you did the Egyptian? <clears throat> Word spread awfully fast. And uh, Moses uh, didn't realize he was 40 years shy of leading Israel. He was too arrogant to be used of God. And he needed 40 more years in the wilderness. And the next time God called him out of the burning bush, Moses said, I'm not, I, I can't do it, Lord. What a difference between the man who set out to do it all by himself and the man who said, Lord, I can't do it. It took 40 years to get him to the place where he wasn't able to do it. God isn't looking for a lot of people who think they can turn the world upside down. He's looking for people who will be used of God the Holy Spirit to turn the world upside down. And the trouble is, too many believers are filled with themselves and they aren't used by, can't be used by God because they're wrapped up in themselves. What I want to be, what I want to do. It's not what we want to do, it's what God wants us to do. And you can push yourself and get yourself anywhere you want to get by using human viewpoints, methods, and method, uh, uh, psychology. But we know this, that ten years it took for God to get Saul ready for the ministry that at least he's going to record for us in the Word of God. Now when they come uh, in uh, to the church at Antioch in the middle of verse 26, so for a whole year Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. The word, any word that ends in a suffix, I-A-N, uh, means belonging to the party of. And so uh, a, uh, a patrian belonging to the party of the uh, uh, paters. What are the paters? The paters were the fathers. Uh, and uh, the paters were important people. The uh, Christians are members of the party of Christ. And uh, uh, it may have been a word of uh, uh, a put down or it may have been a compliment. We have no way of knowing. I've heard it said many times that this means it was a, a critical statement. We really don't know whether it was or not. We have no way of knowing. But we do know that the organization is working, is functioning here beautifully. Now, uh, what happens next is this uh, uh, famine that takes place that I talked to you about uh, previously. And uh, so it is that the church at Antioch uh, decides uh, to help the brothers living in Judea in Acts 11:29, and this they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Obviously, the center is uh, moving away from uh, Jerusalem. Uh, the mother church, which started everything, uh, is no longer the uh, leading church, and Peter is certainly not the leader. Paul is the emerging leader of the church. But the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has nothing to do with geographical location. There's, that's very, very clear. It popped around many, many places. Which, where was the church headquarters uh, as the book of Acts proceeds? Well, there was no headquarters. Each church was where God wanted it to be at that particular point of time. The point is that the church does not depend not only on geographical location, but also it does not depend on human celebrity ship. Dear Dr. So-and-so, who has a long line of degrees or is a charismatic uh, communicator, 
may or may not be the head. Now Acts chapter 13 uh, is uh, going to be the beginning uh, of uh, the new uh, work. But before we do, just back up one verse to Acts chapter 12. It says, when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, the, the relief work to Jerusalem, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Um, the, uh, per, uh, the tense of the verb indicates having been surnamed Mark would indicate his badge of Roman citizenship. Now, Acts 13 introduces us to the Antioch church in greater detail. In the church at Antioch, obviously the church has been existing. It, uh, by the way, it didn't just begin here because it's already been existing. Uh, there were prophets and teachers. And then they're listed for us. And uh, it's quite a cosmopolitan church. Barnabas is a Jew from Cyprus. Uh, apparently, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, Simeon, who was a black man. Lucius was from North Africa. Manaean had been reared in the same place as Herod Antipas, who had beheaded John the Baptist and treated our Lord so shamefully. Interestingly, one became a believer, Manaean, the other Herod, had become an antagonist, both raised in the same environs, apparently. And then we have, a, then we have finally, the last name on the list is Saul, who had been trained in the best rabbinical school. But apparently, despite their diversity, these men acted in one accord in their ministry of the Word of God. And while they were in the process of carrying out their ministry, the Holy Spirit gave them specific direction. Now, the church is not yet established as far as the finished, completed canon of Scripture. Therefore, God the Holy Spirit still was in the process of speaking to men. However, once the canon of Scripture was completed in 96 A.D., God has stopped communicating to men by means of dreams, visions, voices, or any other methodology other than the completed written Word of God. But since there was no completed canon of Scripture, a divine po uh, guidepost by which uh, one could determine whether one was called or not. The Holy Spirit spoke, and he says in Acts 13, 2, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. The word called is in the perfect tense, indicating that it is something that took place in eternity past, which was just revealed at this time, however. The passive voice indicates that Barnabas and Saul received this invitation from God the Holy Spirit. And when they laid hands on them, which was simply a way of identify, identification of the church with the ministry that was to be carried out by these two men, they began their work. And where did they go? Well, they began their work in Barnabas's home territory. And that was if they became evangelists, missionaries, to the island of Cyprus, which would be uh, following this line here, to the island of Cyprus. Obviously, uh, Barnabas wanted his uh, family, and besides that, this was also the area, remember, from which someone had come to Antioch, and now they perhaps were encouraging Paul and Barnabas to go back to their relatives, their loved ones, their friends, and their families to communicate the truth of the, the Word of God. Now, at any rate, Barnabas and Saul, together with uh, John Mark, according to verse 5, John was with them as their helper. 
they set out for this first missionary journey. Now, there are two things that take place on this island in addition to the, uh, the ministry that they had there. Uh, the implications are up to this point, Barnabas has been the leader of the team. It's been always Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. But in Acts 13.9, we read something differently. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. So the first thing that happens is that Paul's name, Saul is, has a name change. Saul's name becomes uh, Paul. Saul uh, was the traditional name of the warrior leader. And though Paul, in his original makeup, may have been the warrior like King Saul, now he is Paul, and Paul means little. It was to be, perhaps, a remembrance throughout all of his life as to who and what he was, the total product of grace. For whatever his name came uh, was used, it would say forever that I am nothing in the eyes of the Lord. I am what I am by the grace of God. But also something else uh, takes place because from this time on, there is a change. Notice verse 13. From Paphos, Paul and his companions. Apparently, a change of leadership. No longer Barnabas and Saul, but now Paul and his companions. Again, it's thrilling to note, Mr. Grace, Barnabas, without any kind of rival spirit or jealousy, gladly steps aside and moves into the background as he discerns that obviously Paul was God's choice to lead the team. We also note that Paul wasn't pushy to become the leader. It seems significant that after he becomes little, he becomes the leader. I think that that's not just coincidental. Well, Having gone through this uh, island and having had a very interesting ministry and some clashes with the demon spirits, they finally leave Cyprus from the other end of the island and they travel this way up to the coastal area of Pamphylia and land at the city of Perga in Pamphylia in verse 13. Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where, and then we read, John left them to return to Jerusalem. Now, there have been a number of suggestions as to why John left. I'll give you six of them. Pick out whichever one you like. There's no biblical basis for preferring one over the other. Um except the only other reference we have is the dissension which takes place between Paul and Barnabas, which we'll look at in a moment. One, it says perhaps he was disillusioned at the change of leadership when it passed from his cousin to Paul. Maybe he didn't like that and he left, so says some commentators. Two, the new emphasis on taking the gospel to the Gentiles which took place on the island of Cyprus, may have been too much of an adjustment for a Palestinian Jew like Mark. Three, it may have been that he became afraid after seeing the encounters with the powers of darkness on the, and the sorcerer in Cyprus. Four, the land ahead of them between Perga and Pamphylia and where they were going up here to Pisidian Antioch was a very, very hard road which led through the l marshy lowlands of Pamphylia over the Taurus Mountains. So it was going to be a very difficult road ahead 
and maybe Mark didn't want to uh, to follow through on this. Um, and uh, five, it was in these lowlands of Pamphylia that Paul contracted an eye disease. In uh, Galatians 4.13 we read, Because of an illness, I preached the gospel to the churches of Galatia. It, uh, and it's possible that he picked it up uh, even here in uh, Perga and in Pamphylia, and that in discouragement over Paul's illness, uh, and the possibility that he might be stricken, that Mark heads for home. And then sixthly, there are some who think Mark became homesick. Uh, his mother was a widow, Acts 12, 12, and he had been gone from her for quite some time. Apparently, his uh, uh, because she was a widow, uh, she perhaps doted on him and uh, did a lot more things for him than Paul or Barnabas would have done. And uh, the apron strings were not cut, and therefore uh, he needed to go home to Mama. And that's, of course, the that's what I the thing I prefer. But I wouldn't be dogmatic and have a, a big argument with anybody. Whatever the cause, Paul considered it a defection. Turn over to Acts chapter 15 for a moment. In Acts 15.36, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamph and had not continued with them in the work. And we notice that the tension or the disagreement uh, international because of a sharp agreement, which is the way the Greek is really translated. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas taking Mark and sailing for Cyprus, Paul choosing Silas, and uh, 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 went back through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the Galatian churches. Perhaps uh, uh, this, this uh, rupture lasted a long time. But our Lord Jesus Christ had said, take your Bible, turn back, keep your finger, we're coming back to Acts 13, but turn back to uh, Luke chapter 9. Our Lord had, uh, had uh, those who were uh, ostensibly ready to follow him. The Lord, uh, uh, in, in Luke 9, 62, the Lord Jesus Christ after the three men, and we'll go, we'll look, we'll look. But here's the principle. The Lord Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom service in the kingdom of God. What's it that brought this up? Well, there were three young men who alleged that they wanted to follow the Lord. And uh, they begin in verse 57. Uh, as they were walking along the road and said to him, follow you where oh. The Lord Jesus said, Foxes, souls, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. What did he say? He said, there, I don't have a, I, but he, he said, no, I have no home. You understand that, don't you? He said to another man, follow me. But the man said, first let me go and bury my father. The, the, Jesus said, let the b dead bury their dead. You proclaim the kingdom of God. Sounds rather harsh. But what he was saying is, let me return home till my father dies. His father wasn't dead. The funeral service was tomorrow. Uh, or the same day, the Jews always uh, a quick burial. He was simply saying that uh, I can't leave until my father dies, then I'll follow you. And the Lord, uh, of course, looks askance at that. Then the third one, in verse 61, he says, I'll follow you, but first let me go back and say something to my, my family, uh, say goodbye. Uh, the first quit when he found out he had to give up what he considered the necessities of a comfortable home. The second, he had, when he had to place his the service of God above his family. And the third, simply because he did not see the gravity and the urgency of following the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, becoming uh, one who serves the kingdoms and the lords must understand that it is not a convenience. It is not something that I fit into my schedule. It is the priority of my life. Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 9, 16. Woe to me if I proclaim not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, thank the Lord that as long as we're alive, He has a plan for our lives. You're not finished until the fat lady sings. Is that what it says? Well, 
you're not finished. Let's turn to Second Timothy chapter four. Yes, the apostle Paul was wrong from time to time. And this was uh, one case. Second Timothy chapter four and verse eleven. Verse, well, look at verse 10. Uh, For Demas, because he has loved this world, has deserted me, and went to Thessalonica. Demas did the same thing to him that John Mark had done before. And the evidence uh, uh, is not that these others two had deserted him, but that they had gone on missions. Uh, Crescens had gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke, good old Dr. Luke, is with me. And he says this, get Mark. And bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. <laughs> he, he lived to regret the words. We all realize that young John Mark is the man who wrote the book of the Bible that bears him the gospel according to Mark. So be encouraged, beloved. As long as you're alive, God has planned for your life. And even if you're, and even if you fail the Lord, uh, it's not all over. Though looked at that point very much like it was over for young John Mark. Paul wasn't queered on young people, I want you to know, because in this next uh, passage, several passages, he's going to come across another young man by the name of Timothy. And he's going to take and allow Timothy to join him as his helper. It's just that he felt so let down by John Mark. All right, back to Acts chapter 13. Let's see where they go in verse 14. Paphos, uh, they go to Perga, and from Perga, they went to Pisidian Antioch. Now, uh, here's Pisidian Antioch, and we just follow it straight north here. Pisidian Antioch. Seleucus, the first Nicator, one of the generals the, of the Macedonian Empire, when it was uh, divided into four after the death of, of uh, uh, Alexander the Great, named many cities after his father, Antiochus, the great Macedonian leader. He, uh, and they're, they're all over the place, and they're, they're, you have to dis determine where they are by the location. Uh, this would be called a Syrian Antioch over here, this is Pisidian Antioch, or Antioch of Pisidia. Pisidia being one of the provinces, see. But uh, he also encouraged Jewish colonists to settle throughout the area called Phrygia. You'll notice the name here. Phrygia for political and commercial reasons. The Emperor Augustus gave the city of Antioch the status of a Roman colony, and when they arrived there, obviously, it was a perfect place because it had a, a Roman uh, a colony status, meaning that Paul had perfect access, and it was also a Jewish colony, uh, Jew had a large Jewish group, which meant that there was going to be a synagogue in that area. And so it was that the Apostle Paul does what he always did first, took the gospel to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. In Acts chapter 13, verse 14, on the Sabbath, the last part of verse 14, on the Sabbath day, they entered the synagogue and sat down. In every synagogue service, it was customary to read from the law and the prophets. Now, later on, there was a division between the law, the prophets, and the writing. But the, the scrolls were basically divided into the law, which is the first five books of Moses, and the prophets, the balance of the Old Testament. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, which would be a portion from each, then uh, someone uh, would be invited to uh, share a message of encouragement to the people. And if there were any visiting rabbis who were there, they were always recognized uh, and distinguished by this recognition. And just so happened, Paul was a Jewish rabbi. 
And so it was his privilege. You'll notice it says in verse 15, After the reading from the law and the prophets, the synagogue rulers sent word to them saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. Uh, <laughs> Paul never needed more than one word of, of invitation. I always said, I'll speak at the drop of invitation. And I, I guess I'm following in the, uh, the, the lineup of uh, one of my grand relatives, you see. We have a long line of Paulies. This is St. Pauli, uh, who uh, is one of my others, you know. You've heard of John Pauli Jones and Pauli Revere. And, of course, Pope Pauli. Uh, those are all relatives that uh, <coughs> one of them is a black sheep. But anyway, um, the point is that standing up, Paul motioned and he gave uh, his um, uh, he gave a, a lovely message and the first recorded sermon preached by Paul illustrates how he moves the, from the known to the unknown you cannot teach unknown from unknown you teach from known to unknown and uh, in the chapter 13 verse 16 through verse 25 uh, he the the first part of his he had a three-point sermon. The, uh, <laughs> the first part was the coming of Messiah. Second, from 1326 to 37, the rejection of Messiah. And thirdly, from 38 to 41, the application and appeal. I'm not going to go into the, the whole message. Uh, you are welcome to read it. But uh, uh, he lays the death of our Lord Jesus Christ directly at the feet of of the Jews where it belonged. Of course, we all understand that in the plan of God, they acted really on behalf of the entire human race because it was our sin which nailed him to the tree. But as he com comes to the conclusion uh, of uh, his message, uh, quoting Habakkuk 1 5 uh, in verse 41. The Apostle Paul issues an appropriate warning against impending judgment. Believe or be judged. Now, as the service closed, verse 42, as the service comes to a conclusion, there was generally a very favorable response to Paul's message. Even an invitation to come back again and speak the next week on the same subject. The Jewish leaders, however, after his second message, it's not very clear, the, the, the text is not very clear, but it appears that in verse 43, after his second message, that the Jewish leaders uh, uh, talked abusively against what Paul was saying, contradicting what Paul had said. And uh, in the Greek, uh, the word uh, contradict is to talk abusively. And uh, that's what they did. They talked abusively uh, against Paul and Barnabas. Uh, Paul and Barnabas, uh, there's no beating around the bush. Notice uh, verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and they talked abusively against what Paul was saying then Paul says and he's again we had to speak the Word of God to you first but since you rejected and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life we turn now to the Gentiles and this pattern is establishes the pattern it's going to happen from city after city after in city after city after city even until Paul reaches Rome. And there, for the final time in the book of Acts, Paul turns from the Jews to the Gentiles. I'm reminded of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, in which he says in chapter 2, verse 6, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age, or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. 
None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Paul then indicates the condition of the unbeliever in 2.14 when he says, For the man without the Spirit, the soulish man, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And as the Apostle Paul comes to the a crossroad in his life, we have to remember this. We are not responsible for the what kind of a reception the gospel receives. That's between the hearers and God. We are responsible, however, to take the message of the good news that Christ died for our sins and the message of Bible doctrine to those who are willing to hear and in the privacy of their own priesthood will respond. And we have to leave them with the Lord. In some places, some will respond. Some places, they will not respond. The Old Testament prophecy, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Isaiah 49, 6 was directed to Israel, but they failed was also true of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in Acts 13, 48, it says, When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, they honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. We'll deal with that in our next class when we talk about what it means to be appointed to eternal life. But it's a thrilling thing to see that Paul takes the gospel to whomever wants it and leaves the balance the, the response to them one of the things which we will observe as we see the warm uh, welcome that the Apostle Paul received how gracious and wonderful these people were how they turned on him in just a short time because of the influence of the Judaizers and the legalists you never put your trust in men. You simply are to be found faithful in the communication of what God entrusts, and that is the good news of the gospel. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for our study this evening as we have moved rapidly through a number of uh, passages and a number of years in the, the lives of these great men, particularly the Apostle Paul and the the first visit that he had to the churches of Galatia and uh, what happened uh, when he went there. We're so grateful that here was a man who was faithful to do what you told him to do, and that is to give out the gospel. May we be found faithfully doing the same thing in the world to which we have been sent. We do have a message that needs to be taken to the nations, beginning with our own. In Jesus' name, may we be found faithful.